out the, the book, which is basically a br very brief overview of the culture history. Okay. And so the, the first thing you need to deal with, with Abenaki, or for that matter, any of the native groups, is words. You know, who calls who what. And I have sat in on so many arguments about is it Wobanaki, is it Abenaki, is it you know, Penacook, are they Mazisquoi? Who cares? I mean, I'm sure political things care, but the names are, like the language, are very fluid. The traditional names probably were commentary about geography, like people who live near Winnipesaukee, Winnipesaukeeok, people who live near Mazisquoi, near the Flint mine, Mazisquoiok. It, it wasn't an ethnic identity. It was a regional or a geographical or a local identity. And the same person could be this year at Mazisquoi and that year at Winnipesaukee. And it, it's the same person. So I'm not going to get all hung up on names. Because with the names, we have what we call ourselves, we have what the French and the English called us, we have what the you know, state of Maine calls us, which is not repeatable. Um, <laughs> so let's start out with um, the, the, the collection, we are al Nombak, which means simply the people. Well, it means the common people, right? Well, just the people. Okay, al Nombak. The specifically al nombak Wubanakik, the people of the East, as distinct, obviously, from the people of the West, North, and South. Okay? So if you look at all of, uh, of native languages, there's always a we the people statement. You know, you know what, what is your name? Al-Nombak, 
you know, who are, you know, it's sort of like, well, I'm a person, are you, you know, kind of thing. So all, it's all al nombak. Now, that particular people speak a, either one multilingual language, multi-dialect, or multiple dialects, mm -hmm. or a nuanced language like uh, Italian to French, where you actually can understand each other. Again, don't sweat the details. If I go to Penobscot territory, I can understand what they were saying. If I go to Chippewa, I can understand three quarters of what they're saying. Mm -hmm. you know, so th it's this Northeastern Algonquin group. The particular identities are of interest only to the modern political system. And it's the modern political system that insists on uh, is your group uh, <coughs> all related to the same people? You, you marry within, not out. Uh, do you all have a common language and a common religion? Okay, th those are all uh, imposed from the outside. You know, ethnopolitics is a modern concept. Uh, it not, it's not that it didn't exist previously, but the uh, the issue wasn't you know which tribe do you belong to. If we go back to 1750, the issue was what race do you belong to, and if you go back to 1700, it's what religion do you belong to. So there's always been us and them. It's just you know different different numbers of them or us. Okay, is that okay? And then usually if you ask one, if the French, say the French come along, and they ask one village people, what do you call the guys upriver, they're going to come back with some snaky little nindri, okay? So uh, some of the words uh, are really, you know, the, uh, like the Mi'kmaq referred to the interior population as El Muchaqua, which literally means dog people. But the way they looked at it, it, it means people who sleep with dogs, which is rude. Mm. But it could also mean, you know, people who have dogs as a common animal, people who use dogs as sled dogs. You know, dog people means you know, a great many things, but it's usually rude. Okay. The Abenaki called the Mohawk Magua, yeah. which means cowards. Because ah, right. ah, a lot, a lot of people think it off. means cannibals. What? They took them off. Yeah, it means cowards, basically. They, people they who run away from battle. Fear. Okay. And they called at least the, the Vermont group of Abenaki Adirondack, mm -hmm. which means people who eat tree bark. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, if you ask the neighbors, they're going to say rude things. Mm -hmm. If you ask the locals, they're going to say, well, we're people. What are you? You know, so the the names are very fluid and don't get upset. You know, uh, now nowadays it's a bit of a problem because you know folks argue over political and territorial and reservation and recognition and all that. Those are not our problem. I mean, they are, but they really aren't. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're very often. The, if you will, a label would be referring to a place uh, in English, people who live on the Kennebec, people who live on the Mazuskoi, people who live on uh, Lake Menfermagog. That usually was a village or a couple of villages. You know, that, that's a place that people live. So if uh, it's uh, 1780, and we're, we're interviewing ha, we're interviewing the Indian doctress Maliagat, very famous lady, very, uh, lived to be 102 or st allegedly. Okay, now she was born probably in Nerijawak, po possibly in uh, a little up, maybe near Skowhegan. She 
spent some of her early adult years at Odenach, spent some of her early uh, teenage years in Boston. Ah, as a hostage. And ends up with her married daughter in Derby, and finally dies over in Bethel, Maine. Now, this is just one woman. Hmm. So what tribe did she belong to? Yeah, that's, that's why, you know, it's al I mean, she's clearly one of those, but is she Nwijewaka? Is she Odinaka? Is she Pastania? No, they're, they're wandering. I've studied a lot of native people and the, uh, the Abenaki people, for one reason or another, have a lot of wandering. They were by nature, I think, uh, wanderers, but then this was ground zero for the European, the French-English Euro European uh, invasion. So as a result, the ancestors got scattered everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you find Abenaki people, they may be no, nowhere near where they started out being. Mm -hmm. I know of an Abenaki community in Tucson, Arizona, which is like, what are you doing out there, girl? And, and another one in Vancouver. Of Australia. You know, so it, it's like, okay, obviously they got bumped a little farther than others. So it's really hard to, you know, you, you can't really say, you know, my people are from Missisquoi. Well, yeah, they, they might be. On the other hand, there may be Penacook who came to Missisquoi because to get away from them. You don't know. It's mixing and matching and people coming and going. That's why I don't get hamaka, hamaka. Bah, whatever. Now, another thing you can find is at the time that the French arrived in the Northeast, which is more or less 1600, they encountered natives on the coast of Nova Scotia and probably ask something of, you know, who are these people? Who are those people? You know. And the words that were written down, Suraqua, for instance, that's not an Abnaki name. That's a Mohawk name. So at least by the language, there were some Iroquois folk uh, on the northern fringe, if you will, of, of the uh, Abenaki territories which is okay, they're supposed to be there. But that leads to a, a second question of where is the ethnic language barrier? Or is, is there one? The, nowadays, we have the Algonquins, uh, the Wabanaki folk in Maine, New Hampshire, uh, Vermont and Eastern Canada and the Maliseet along the St. John River and the Mi'kmaq mostly in, in the Maritimes. Mm. But were they there always? And the, the Iroquois, there are Iroquois in the St. John, in, in the St. Lawrence Valley. Um, there's a reserve at, of Huron or Wyandot at Quebec City. And then there's a reserve of Mohawk at Montreal. Are the Huron and Mohawk the same people, or are they different but speak the same language? Mm. Do you see the compl the problem? Mm. Yeah. So I, I can't solve it. I'm just making making note that when you're reading the uh, traditional texts and the mission reports, the people can be called practically anything, including men from Mars. Okay. And the territory, it varies, but the ter they get the territory more or less correct. The land of the Wabanaki is, goes from the Adirondacks, more or less, to the Atlantic Ocean. And from the south shore of the St. Lawrence, more or less, to about where Springfield, Massachusetts is now. So it encompassed nearly all the highland parts of New England. 
most of the people were hunter-gatherer fishers, a little bit of, of farming, but it's really too cold to do co corn agriculture this far north. In the corn, the, the corn prior to hybridization required 120 frost-free days, and we don't usually get that. We're lucky mm. to get 90. Mm. So until potatoes came in, that was 1750 to 1800, there really wasn't any crop that would sustain in the winter. So hunter-gatherer fisher, bits and bats. And as a result, a hunter-gatherer fisher way of life, you're wandering everywhere. The uh, maybe the fish aren't aren't at one stream this year. Maybe they're that, maybe at another one, so you wander to the other one. It's just the nature of that you know, wild foraging way of life. That being said, families did have hunting territories. You know, and and family is not just mom, dad, the kids, and the anthropologist. <laughs> it, it it's this big clan like you know, um, 40 or 50 people. And they did claim certain hunting territories. Um, I'm in the, right now I'm living in the St. John Valley of Northern Maine. That's bear hunting, the bear clan territory. Um, the turtle territory was around here um, in the Northeast Kingdom. The, and there, I think, were 13 major families, at least at 1700, when somebody wrote them all down, there were 13. You mean those clans you're talking about? Sort of. Oh. But uh, oh. it's not as clear as clan or as organized as tribe. It's a collection of people who have this territory. Moieties? No, not even that clear. It, it's very, it, everything is very fluid. A moiety is this half of this village is, is um, say, summer people and the other half are winter people. That requires a little bit of organization. And I'm not saying the Abenaki were not organized, but that's not how they were thinking. Mm -hmm. the, the thinking, if, if you are of the people, the group, whose hunting territory it is, the, the spirits of that hunting territory will allow you to hunt. And you will be able to get your deer and your moose and whatever else you're hunting. If you are not of the right family, you will not be successful. In other words, it's fairly clear. And if you look at it sort of objectively, well, that's probably true because, you know, your dad and your grandfather and your grandmother and all that have, have hunted over that territory, so they've probably told you where the deer yards were and where the salmon spawning grounds were. So you have been told from childhood where the areas are, so you are probably much more likely to find what you're hunting for than a stranger who had just wanders in. But how it's explained is the spirits of the woods uh, recognize a fellow a member of, of that woods or don't, as the case may be. And this is one of the explanations for why the white people starved to death in the middle of plenty, which they often did. Mm. It's because they didn't recognize the food that was out there. You know, I suppose if Abenaki had gone down to, to uh, Boston, they would have starved to death in the middle of food there, too. So it's n no disrespect to anybody, but you have to know what the land is. You have to know what the land provides. So far, so good, though? Mm -hmm. Okay, Abenaki, um, probably the other Algonquin groups, too, they usually had a, a kind of like a home village in mm. a sheltered part mm. of, of their territory. Yeah. And at that home village, there would have been uh, the, the cemetery you know, where they bury the Now, sometimes those villages were totally abandoned. When it was a deliberate abandonment, 
the, the people would take down all the buildings, all the wigwams, dismantle the log cabins, dig up the graveyard, and bundle those graves, and just move everybody, dead and alive, to the new location. So it's a complete abandonment. Otherwise, maybe it doesn't have a lot of people at any given time, but they haven't abandoned it. They're just out hunting or you know, gone fishing. It's kind of like uh, rural towns in the summertime. You can't find anybody around because they've all gone fishing. <coughs> so, but the town isn't abandoned. It's just everyone's gone fishing. So the Abenaki towns had this fluctuating population and were occasionally abandoned and moved out. So far, so good there? So that you're using two terms, complete abandonment, and what's the other term? Um, sort of, uh, um, the, well, that's not abandoned, uh, depopulated. Depopulated. You, know, the, uh, you would depopulate maybe for the moose hunt, which needed nearly everybody to go hunting. Uh, and so there would be you know, two families left out of a 300 fa family village. And then hopefully you get the moose and, and you bring back and now everyone's home again. Now, of course, when the French and the English come in, they are used to total, you either live there or you don't live there. It's one or the other. Mm. I guess they never heard of summer camps. So when the English and the French came in and they see these nearly depopulated towns, they're assuming that the towns are actually abandoned mm -hmm. when they aren't. They're, they're simply gone fishing. So there's a bit of a cultural problem there, because there was one case I, I lost. It's over Charleston somewhere. Uh, yes, yeah. I just found out about that. Oh my gosh. OK. Once upon a time, probably 1700s, um, most of that flat land by Pensioner's Pond, that was a glacial lake. It was a pretty big sized lake. There was a sh some sort of an earthquake, I think, and it broke the earth dam, and all the lake ran away down the Clyde River into the Mimfermega. And so the area became known as Lost Lake. Oh. There was a village at Lost Lake, and they had gone hunting, and they came back around 1840, and they found English settlers living on their territory. And the English didn't, you know, say, this is ours, you know. So at that point, the Lost Lake population, the, the community of native people at Lost Lake, dug up their cemetery and dismantled their uh, buildings and left. So that, that is the total abandonment of, of Lost Lake. And that occurred about 1840. Oh, the hmm? farm owner that owns uh -huh. a parcel of where that lake was, mm -hmm. and I learned this just two weeks ago, <laughs> there's a part where it skips back up. Huh. And um, every two years or so, uh -huh. he has to clean that off so that he can re rehab uh -huh. that piece of property. Uh -huh. And right now, it has spit back up. It's all sand, uh -huh. and there's seashells, and there's uh, artifacts, and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. But he cleans it all up, and then it's good for a couple of years, and then it'll burp again, and it'll all call, spit back up. Yeah. But it's all from that from that Right, lake. and, and that, that so those sand geysers is very typical of an active earthquake fault line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. which explains a great deal of what happened to the lake. It all ran away because of the dam. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. If you go to, to uh, the New Madrid fault line down uh, St. Louis the area, there's all, all of these uh, geyser you know, flat land, and then you have these splots of, of sand. Uh, you know, and that's from it, it's an active seismic zone um, kicking up wet sand. Uh huh. 
Okay then. <laughs> well, so where um, you <laughs> yes. Melinda Maxwell you showed sure? it to me. Ah. So she was going to get permission from the landowner before he puts it back in uh -huh. or cleans it up that we can kind of maybe go peek. Mm. And well, that would be cool. And touch things. That would be cool. So I'm I'm waiting for her to say yes, we can, and we're hmm. going to go. From Jesse, would you? What's this? What's that? I know. I'm going to give him a call. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I am going to bring him with me. Sure. Mm -hmm. There's a there's a sign that said Lost Nation. She was off 91. Oh. You heard of that? It's near here. Oh, oh yeah. that's New York. Yeah. Lost Nation Road. Yeah. 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 Did, that, did you mean anything about that? That. Lost Nation, that was a population that probably either cholera or smallpox. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they, they mostly died and the rest abandoned. Mm -hmm. And that was 1820 or so. Mm -hmm. There's and, a Lost Nation in near Lancaster, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Most of those refer to the last major epidemic uh, in these parts. Mm -hmm. uh, now, cholera came around in... 1820, I think, and then there was a smallpox epidemic at about the same time. A uh, scarlet fever uh, epidemic. And all of those are pretty lethal diseases. So, you know, one or the other probably led to abandonment. Mm -hmm. And not just a, a, of native populations, but European yeah. settler populations mm -hmm. moved also. Mm -hmm. um, because like West Glover, they, they moved from Parker Pond down uh, because Parker Pond was contaminated uh, with cholera, so they moved to the next watershed. And then, yeah, that, that, and, then those, and those were white settlers, mm -hmm. Timothy Hinman and, and his family. That group, okay. Yeah. So this isn't a just a, a thing that Native people do. It was happening all, all across rural areas. And again, people come and go, and different technologies, uh, like railroads is good until the railroads go out, and then you turn it into a bike path. This, life does not stand still. History doesn't stand still. History is simply what we did in the past, but it didn't stand still. And history is made up of individual people making decisions based on what they need to do and what they think is possible. So every, you can't say, for instance, that all of the Jesuits were evil gun-running gun slobs. Well, none of them were actually were gun-running. Some Jesuits were actually quite good. And the Jesuit order, in general, wasn't a bad order. I mean, they weren't like Satanists or anything. It just did the, the, the encounter didn't go quite as well as anyone wanted. So it's not an either or. The, these cultural encounters end up with this person did this, and that person did that. And it's not communities. The missionaries try to keep the booze away from the Indians. Well, the missionaries had their own agendas. Oh, yeah. And it really depended on uh, time. Like the, the missionaries of the 1700s weren't thinking the same as the missionaries of the 1800s. Mm -hmm. So it, you have to actually look, well, it's 1755. Do you know where you are right now making what decisions? OK? And from the hindsight going, why on earth did you do that? Well, yeah, but uh, if you exist at 1755, you don't know the English are going to win the war. If you had, you probably wouldn't have done what you'd done. Mm -hmm. But you did, because you didn't know. See? Mm -hmm. you, know you can't judge the back, the, the past, uh, by the knowledge of the present. You know, none of us know what the future is. Okay, is that so far so good there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's also all sorts of misspellings of names, and again, don't worry about it. I've seen the name Maliseet spelled four different ways, it, and it's a rude name no matter who spells it. Maliseet means people don't people that don't talk good. You know, their their real name is um, people of the Good River, Wulus uh, Dukuyuk. Okay, but you know, if they don't, you know, and I'm just reminded of, of that 
uh, in, in Guardians of the Galaxy, you know, the raccoon is talking mm -hmm. about the tree, you know. His vocabulistics aren't as good as me and you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. The people who were writing things down probably were not familiar with any of the Wabanaki languages, much less anybody else's. The English didn't even know the French language. So we get a lot of really weird, write, um, not mistakes, but uh, you know, things get written down that are nowhere near what they are spoken. And uh, my favorite of all of these is a river in Quebec called Quetapel. Anyone speak French here? A bit. Okay, what does Catapel mean in French? I have no idea. What's its name? Catapel? What's its name? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Who are you? Oh my gosh. Yeah. What is your name? Oh, what is your name? That out of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and that's the name of the river. Mm -hmm. And I can, I can just see this missionary or this trapper come into a bunch of people and they're saying Catapel. What's you know? it called? What's it called? And that's the name of the river now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, anyhow. Yeah. So things like that happen. A final uh, thing about names is they are relative to the person speaking. Uh, like the word Connecticut, it does mean a long river, but it's not a long in distance. It's, I t it takes me a long time to get from here to there. That's what long river actually means. So things are relative to the speaker. They are not absolute. Uh, in, in English and in French, you have these absolutes, like a river is a river is a river. Mm -hmm. You don't do that in Abenaki. Mm -hmm. A river is a river if I say so, but maybe you think it isn't. And maybe it's a fast running stream, and over there it's a, sh a shallow stream. Now to the English it's the same way. No, it isn't. It's different qualities. So you have to be careful there also. What about the difference between Teku and Cebu? They both mean river. No, actually, they're used as river. Yeah, but water. Teku means running water and Cebu means stream. Mm -hmm. you know, so is the Clyde River a Teku or is it a Cebu? Well, it looks to me like a Cebu. It's pretty narrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, and after, Lo, uh, after Lost Lake let go, it probably, at least for that time period, was a Teku. Mm -hmm. You're confused there? No. It, it's the qualities of things, not, n not the things themselves. Okay. With the history, we basically start with the Ice Age. Uh, and this is northern North America, everything starts with the Ice Age. Yeah, I know, there were lots of things before the Ice Age, but you've got to start somewhere. So the ice uh, achieved its maximum, let's say, 15,000 years ago. I mean, who's counting? But, uh, and was melting back um, up to about 11,000 years ago. Again, who's counting? There was. Uh, up here, since there's no salt water here, it, the glaciers held on longer. Down along the coast, where the salt water could erode them, they, they cleared out a little faster. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the, the ice, everything, the ice is all melted back, but it's pretty open rock, and the vegetation is uh, what we would call tundra nowadays. Uh, moss, lichen, uh, little stunty blueberries, little wild willows. Nothing big, n nothing taller than your knees. So it, I know it's really hard to imagine, but from all the way up here, all the way down to Pennsylvania is open land. Mm -hmm. Just think about that for a moment. No trees from here to Pennsylvania. It's hard to wrap your mind around. You know, this is open tundra plain. Now, that facilitated the migration of people all up and down. And they, the East Coast people at 11,000 years ago, more or less, were mainly hunting caribou as a big game and any small game that they came across. 
they, there wasn't a whole lot of fishing done because the rivers were still full of rock dust. Which, you, yeah, you can have fish in rock dust rivers, but it, you don't have many of them. And the, uh, the coasts were fluctuating too much for uh, mussel beds and things to establish very successfully. Again, there were some. So most of the, mo the, most of the occupation was hunting gathering. No fishing, or very little fishing. And they're following migratory caribou. And caribou will migrate over 1,000 miles. So the caribou and the people and then the caribou and the people. And, and that goes basically from Nova Scotia all the way down to Pennsylvania. One big macro culture of people. Are these Abenaki? No. Are they the ancestors? Probably. I mean, well, who else would they be? And of course, the question of who else would they be, is they could be anybody. Because people move in, people move out. And what we have left at, of that time period is all technology. Technology isn't people. Technology is tools. And a tool can be used by anybody, including a trained chimpanzee. So you get the, the fluted paleo points which are about yay long, and they look kind of like leaves. Um, the, the clovis are, the, are bigger ones. The folsoms are smaller ones. Um, then the plano are really narrow ones. Does that mean that everybody is the same people? And no, it means people are using similar technologies. So yes, we have these fluted point populations from Nova Scotia to Pennsylvania. They're using the, these uh, caribou spears, basically. Do they hunt other animals? Sure. Whatever, whatever else is out there. What's out there on the Arctic plains now? Well, you've got rabbits, Arctic hare, Arctic fox, you've got ptarmigan, you know, whatever's there. Opportunistic. But the primary were caribou. Out west, uh, in the 19th century, it was bison herds. OK, so that the paleo uh, people had basically two problems. One, one is the, the, the uh, climate, which, yes, this is the end of the Ice Age, so it's still kind of cold. Uh, the, the ice sheet is, is like 300 miles north, so you're going to have constant cold wind and, and rainy and all that. So it's really not a great climate, but um, you know, that, that won't slow you down. But, and the other um, is ice ages are not, again, they're not static. They come and they go. And there was at least one return of glacial conditions it's called the Younger Dryas event if you're a geologist. So everything is mostly melted back around 11,000 years ago. And the ice is, you know, basically at Lake Magog. The ice melted back a little bit more just north of the St. Lawrence. And the ice lake that had backed up all the way into Alberta was now free to run down the St. Lawrence instead of down the Mississippi Valley. Mm -hmm. So imagine a flood of tons and tons and tons of cold ice water dumping into uh, the, the North Atlantic. Mm -hmm. okay. When that happened, it stopped the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream is that warm band of water coming up from the tropics, keeps mm -hmm. Northern Europe warm. Mm -hmm. It stopped for two or three thousand years because of this huge dump of ice water. Oh. So the glaciers came back. Oh. And for two or three thousand years, it was glacial conditions. Maybe not the, th the mile of ice mm. that the, uh, the glaciers were, but 
uh, enough to make the land uninhabitable. Okay. Now, my family has a story about this. But long ago, we lived in the north, and then an evil one cursed the land and turned it into rock, into stone. So we had to go and live in the sand dunes by the sea, way to the north, way to the south. Mm -hmm. And we lived there, and the people who lived in the sand dunes by the sea did not want us hunting. So the children were starving. If you read Abenaki stories, they're always hungry. You know, always hungry. So a white spirit woman came in a dream to the women and said, go back north. There's two bathrooms. The stone is not there anymore. And the women told the men, and the men said, you're lying. So the women took the kids and started north without the men. And, and the men followed. And when they got back into the north, they did indeed find that the, the stone was gone. And in its place were shrubs and pools of water. And a strange animal, which lit it translates as curled-nosed beast. The strange animal, or the stiff-legged moose, stood twice the height of a man had spears in its face and a snake where its nose should be. In a what? Yeah. In a what? Where its nose should be? A, a, a snake where its nose should oh. be. Spears in its face. Oh. Stood twice the height of a man. A a, and was... Mastodon. It's a mastodon. Yeah. Or a mammoth. Yeah. Uh, so why does our language have a name for mastodon? Huh. You know, which it does. Abenaki does have a name. It, it's called Strange Beast. It, that's yes. how it translates. But this is an elephant. Mm -hmm. you know, okay. Mm -hmm. And again, in my family's stories, you know, and and they uh, the the moose challenged the uh, the strange beast to a duel, and the moose won. So the beast went away to the north. Mm -hmm. End of story. I mean, the Abenaki stories have no morals. You know, they just end. But there is a story of basically the younger the, the the younger Dryas pushing people south, and when they come back, the remnant uh, mastodon or, or uh, mammoth or whatever, probably a mastodon, um, were in the process of migrating north. Okay, so that puts the the, the Abenaki people on the land at least by 6,000, uh, 8,000 years ago. Were they before? Probably. But th this, this is the most ancient story that I was able to collect. Mm -hmm. And y you find it, uh, my family, and my family's uh, ancient people are from the hill, from the White Mountains. So it's, you find it all the way over into Maine. So other people have the story, slightly different, but um, so, end of the Younger Dryas, uh, 8,000, maybe 7,000. Again, are they Abenaki as we know? No, but they definitely are the ancestors because, you know, the people are there. Okay. There's... In terms of Paleo-Indian sites, there may be thousands that we don't know about, because since the ice age, the ocean has, has risen about 300 feet. So if, if they were on the seacoast, uh, they are now underwater. But there are sites up at Bay of Fundy, across the heights of land, at Asakos Lake in western Maine, uh, a couple in uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, and quite a few down, going down the, the uh, height of land down to Pennsylvania. So the, the, the people existed. They never got north of the St. Lawrence. So that, that's the sort of the culture barrier to the north. Um, 
If you were looking at a giant tundra-ish kind of plane, where would you put your camp? Okay. You, you're, you're hunting over a, a tundra-ish open plain, and you want to build a camp. Okay. Where would you put your camp? Probably in a high spot. On a high spot. Okay. And uh, how about e orientation, east, north, west, south? Oh, the doors are face east, and the sun can come in right yeah. away in the morning. Yeah. You, you, you face east because that's the, the sun comes up. You, you, your camp will be warm. Either that or you, face, it, you could face south looking for the caribou. Okay. And well, you know, I mean, this makes sense to us. High land, just, just high just high ground, uh, looking east or south, and that is actually where the few paleo camps have have been found are in the high ground, looking east or south. And these guys were no, they, they weren't stupid. Yeah. So. You also, of course, want to uh, stay out of the bogs and marshes because of the you know, main state bird is the mosquito. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it's all. See, Gluskabe or Odzi Odza, you know, he, he was this great culture hero. A little on the arrogant side. He went up against the, this evil giant, and the giant said, you can't kill me, I am immortal. So he goes, yeah, I can kill anybody I want. So they fight, and they fight, and finally, Odzi Odzi defeats the giant and cuts its head off, and then Bill builds a great pyre to burn the fire, to, bur to burn the giant. And all of the ash and all of the smoke turns into midges, black flies, mosquitoes, and horse flies. Because the giant is immortal. He's just shifted his shape. Yeah. So it's all Guscabe's fault. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's how the, the, uh, the flies and things came into being. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> the ecology of the uh, the end of the ice age. It, yes, it looks like modern tundra, but it was a lot wetter actually. Uh, oh, it was actually a fairly decent place to live. Um, lots of animals, kind of, kind of like the Serengeti Plain, only uh, only in northern Canada. Um, so. Not too many people and lots of game animals. This is, we like this. Um, by 9,000, 10,000 years ago, there were regional cultures. Again, regional technology. Maybe all the same people, but they're using different tools. So they're hunting caribou, yes. Hunting seals, you use, have to use a different tool for that. Hunting migratory geese and swans needs a different technology. So when you see the different technologies, maybe it's not a different people. Maybe they're hunting different resources. And because you know, if you if you're hunting, you you know, you don't use double lot buckshot to kill a mouse. Or, I don't know, maybe you do, but you'd kind of blow the poor mouse to smithereens if you did. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. How are we doing on time? We're good. Okay. So life is good and life is good, and then comes the place to see an extinction. Yeah, which is nearly all of the large animals, larger than a sheep, and half of all the other animals major extinction event. So in North America, there goes the mammoth, the mastodon, the American camel, the American horse, the giant sloth, the giant beaver, uh, around here the woods caribou, you know, the stag moose. Well, th think of a moose on steroids. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. 
Okay. They all go extinct within about two or three hundred years. Yeah. Okay, you know, it's like, why? Dead bodies everywhere. The, everyone says uh, the humans killed them. Well, there weren't that many humans, and that's an awful lot of killed. I, I'm sure that humans didn't make things better. But what was probably happening is the climate change, and you get fragmented ecozones, so the ecozones were sm too small to sustain big animals. Like a, an elephant animal, an elephant type of animal, uh, they, they eat a ton of vegetation per day. Oh, yeah. You know, so, which is fine if you're free to range from, from here to Vancouver, but if it's from here to Menfermagog, there's not enough food. So you get this fragmentation of uh, uh, ecological niches. And of course, then humans are hunting. And it's possible even there was some sort of animal disease. Um, yeah, so chill, kill, or chill, ill, or kill. So what are you going to do? All your, you know, you've been hunting caribou all your life, and your grandfathers and grandfathers before them, and now there's more, no more caribou. What are you going to do? Move or die. Move or die, yeah. So the caribou moved north, and you're still plen plenty of barren grounds of caribou, and a population moved up there. You know, move, adapt, or die. The, other, the ones who stayed put, they adapted. Went after small animals. Um, fishing was then available, so you, you have this changeover into uh, what archaeologists call the general archaic. Forests come in. First, the boreal forest, which is still around just a bit north, and the deciduous forest uh, on the south side, a, a lot of lakes, a lot of streams. So depending on where you are, it's a fairly decent small game location. And fairly decent plants. So the generalized archaic exists for thousands of years, because, you know, why, why why change something that works? And they're hunter-gatherer fishers living in small family bands and migrating all over the place. Does it mean they're not in Vermont? Of course, they're in Vermont at least half of the year, maybe all the year. There's a really nice, er, very early archaic site uh, down on, Black, uh, on the outfall of Mentramingog. It's a great place to hunt frogs and a sturgeon and whatever else. So again, you go where the food is. So one day you're collecting fiddleheads in the spring, and then you go over here with a shad ro run, and over there with the migratory uh, birds. So you're everywhere. Okay. So I'm going to leave it at. Um, with the archaic, the, the growth of the forests, because some things happen after that also. But archaic just thousands of years, because it works. And if you look at modern rural New England, it's, it, it looks very much like archaic, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and mm -hmm. hunting and fishing and gathering, and yeah, farming on the side, but it's a mix and match ecology. And so we, it hasn't gone very far. So, so we'll stop there. OK. Any questions? No? OK. Do you have a song, or does anybody have a song that they would like to you go for? No, no, the song Moen Apple Butter Cheese is a Mick Mac song, The Boy and the Bear. A lot of people sing. Does anybody know that song? Maybe, so. if I hear it. Oh, okay, yeah, you probably heard it. Uh, Moen, bear, it means the one we can bear. Ah, old boy, little boy. And day de babula mulina. Just kind of roll it off your tongue. Day de, uh, anyway. Moen. Moen. Ah, ah. Old boy, little Day de babula mulina. Day de babula mulina. It's hard to slow it down. A to the So it goes like this. Did you 
Yeah, you all drum. We all drum. Everybody drum. It's safe. Yeah. 